Good evening. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. Pastor Garrison, being the class act that he truly is, shared a bit of sympathy with me this evening after last Sunday's outcome in Lambeau Field. He indicated that, uh, or reminded me, that one of the important aspects of his ministry is grief counseling. <laughs> I told him that I was on the road to recovery, but I thanked him very much. Please silence your cell phones. I remind you to take note in your bulletin of where we are going to meet next Saturday. We will be meeting in the gymnasium. The gymnasium is, uh, well, where are you from where you are to your right, going down the hallway. There will be several entrances available. There are several entrances closer to the gym than the one that we use currently and have used for the past year. But it will be open. It will be accessible. So once again, I remind you that next Saturday evening's service with uh, Byron Rhodes, Pastor Byron Rhodes, will be in the gymnasium. The Bergstrom's dishwasher had quit working. <laughs> Mrs. Bergstrom's task was to rinse the dishes, put them in the dishwasher, and uh, her husband, we'll call him Larry, because that is what his name was. Larry's job was to push the start button. The dishwasher didn't start. Mrs. Bergstrom called a repairman she knew from church. Since the Bergstroms were going to be away from their condo at the time that the service man was available to come to check the appliance, she told him, I'll leave the key under the mat by the front door, let yourself in, fix the dishwasher, leave the bill on the counter and I'll mail you a check. And by the way, don't worry about our pet Rottweiler. He won't bother you. But whatever you do, do not, under any circumstances, talk to Larry's pet parrot. <laughs> when the repairman arrived at the Bergstrom's condo the next day, he discovered the biggest and meanest Rottweiler he'd ever seen. But, just like Mrs. Bergstrom said, the dog just lay on the carpet watching the repairman go about his business. However, the whole time he was there, Larry's parrot drove him nuts with his incessant squawking and talking. He told him that he didn't know what he was doing, wasn't using the right tools, he even suggested he was overweight. Finally, the repairman couldn't contain himself any longer, and he yelled, Shut up, you stupid bird! To which the parrot replied, Get him, Brutus! <laughs> Alrighty. As we move to the more serious aspects of this evening's service. This is the last week I've been reading parts of Psalm 96. I like it. I think it has a wonderful message, a very inspiring call to it. And I'll finish up this evening. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing and they will sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples 
in his truth. Please stand as you are able. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. The third day He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Yeah. 
Jesus. Powerful words, right? Man, we just don't sing just to sing. I was one of, I, we're growing up in worship. I, I, I started doing worship in my dad's church when I was like 12, 13 years old. I was playing two fingers, two fingers. And I would just, I would be so nervous. And, and looking at my dad, and my dad would be preaching, preaching his heart out. And I'm, and I'm just playing with two, just nervous, because then I wouldn't eat at home that night if I didn't do it right, you know. <laughs> And I was looking at him, and then and he would cry and worship, and he just sing, and I'm just, man, I gotta do my job, I gotta do my job. And I kept on doing that for a little while, and, and I never understood it. I was just doing what I was told to do, because I was just young, I was 13, 14 years old, just doing what I had to do, because my dad asked me to do it, right? That's how PKs are, pastor's kids. We just, we just start up doing what our dad tells us to do. And we turn off the lights, we clean the bathrooms, whatever we gotta do for the church, right? And I started there, but one day I was worshiping. I was, I was playing the piano, looking at my dad. And I was playing, and I was playing. And then I started feeling something in my chest. I go, man, what is this? And I started crying, and tears started falling on the keys of that piano. And I just went in God's presence, man, just singing. And, just, and I understood what worship was. I understood what worship was. It wasn't just singing a few lyrics on a piece of paper. It wasn't just singing a melody, it was the presence of God. And man, it made a difference in my life. And now as an older, much older guy, um, I go, man, worship is how we fight our battles though. Worship should be that. When we sing, instead of, instead of weapons, this is our weapon. Worship is our weapon. When we sing, when we're going through tough times, when we're going through difficult times, we raise a voice, we raise a voice. For the spirit of heaviness, put on the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness. And there's a beautiful song, goes this. This is how I fight my battles.
you, but uh, this is how I fight my battles. <laughs> and I've uh, been doing that for the last year, well, probably longer than that. So, uh, and I, I, uh, I also fight them by really turning to you the support that we have here at, the, at this church and what a wonderful support it's been for the last year and year and a half. We've got a little ways to go, uh, but things are going along just fine. And we're real excited about the new direction of the church and getting a new pastor. It's just a, it's a wonderful thing that God has done. It opened up so many doors. That uh, I love seeing you all here tonight. And we're just going to get over this COVID and we're going to start worshiping uh, like we've never worshiped before. And we're going to be an alternative, a traditional alternative to some other worships that are going on that aren't. And people are going to come looking for us. And we want to we want to be sure that we do the right thing. We do what God wants us to do. Stay true to the word and don't vary from the truth, the only truth. We had a lot of prayers this weekend. Um, uh, one of them, we'll start with, uh, Lori and I asked that we pray for Don Larson's granddaughter, uh, Caitlin and Julian, who lost their father, Wayne Sherman, this past weekend from a heart attack. And also, and also praying for Don, that his back injury heals and that he and Carol's okay. And Don made it here tonight. Uh, oh, there he is, right there. And uh, he keeps up the good fight, I tell you, and that's, uh, that's what we all do. So I understand uh, Corey, his grandson in law, is uh, having to get some more checkups too. We've been praying for Corey for quite a while. And, uh, had a little tiny setback here. We'll see if it means anything. He's going to go see the doctor, I guess, this next week. Susan Zabrero asked us, uh, she says, if you could please pray for Elizabeth. Uh, she will be having a tonsillectomy this Saturday, June, January 30th. So I, I don't know how the surgery went, but I guess she had the surgery today. day. Um, and uh, pray for God to watch over the surgeon and for her to feel God's presence and healing power. Uh, that's uh, Elizabeth is the one that had the major back surgery too. So she's been through quite a bit for a young girl. Uh, so we'll certainly keep her in our prayers. Uh, Jennifer Oshwood says, uh, as the Wesleyan Fellowship Group embarks on its first anniversary, I was telling people, I pulled out some of the original uh, bulletins that we had, and I think the oldest one I had was February 8th of last year. So I think we're coming up on our anniversary, and uh, what a wonderful year. It's been an odd year, but it's been a wonderful year. Um, we want to thank God for blessing us with committed servants and strong leadership from Fred and Holly and for guiding us through the pandemic and all the tough times endured. Excited for a future as a group and as, as we welcome our new pastor, Myron, great things are ahead of us. Thank you, Jennifer. Nice, nice prayer request. Um, our new pastor and his wife, Annette, and, and Pastor Rhodes ask us to pray, pray for them. Anderson, who is the new baby that they had some problems with, is recovering. She had some lack of oxygen when she was first born and is now getting better, taking nourishment on her own, having normal movements, and so they're pretty excited. Anderson is improving, but we're not out of the woods yet by a long shot. Uh, they will do another MRI tomorrow to determine brain parameters. His biological functions are good. They, uh, they have tripled his milk intake since Monday, and he is Filling his diapers. <laughs> so those are all good things for babies. <laughs> um, Annette, Annette's mom has a bit of fluid in her lungs. She's 96 and had the pneumonia, and she had a bit of fluid. I understand she's going back to her assisted living facility though today, I think. So uh, praise the Lord, got out of the hospital and, and certainly recovering. Annette is doing well from her oral surgery. She had a broken tooth, had to have two surgeons. So um, we wonder if. Uh, if the evil one isn't trying to attack them, they've had a lot of things happen before they came down. They were supposed to be here uh, this right now. Uh, they'll be coming in on Thursday. So we look forward to them uh, next Saturday. Uh, Laura Dusick said, uh, I, would, I want to offer a prayer for Thanksgiving for my brother. He's out of the ICU and is heading in a good direction. Thank you. Thank you to all the folks praying for him in our congregation. Kathy Porter says, uh, this has been a week of only, of only praises. Gary is doing remarkably well. Our daughter, who is, in the first, is a first responder, is vaccinated, and we are spending this weekend visiting her in Georgia. Our two, uh, we had two prayer requests, the Early Learning Center and all the displaced children and staff. 
God, please hold them close in, in this storm. And travel mercies for Gary and I. Uh, not much news that I have on the early learning center. I know this is uh, not good, and I just I think we just all keep praying for everybody and uh, have God's hand come down on us. And so we'll, we'll do that. Please join me in prayer. Father, the prayers list is so long, but we know that you got the answer. And we ask you to come into the hearts and the minds and the spirit of all the people that are following us and all the people around the world to help them understand how important it is to get back to the basics of loving you, loving your son, understanding that he is the truth and the way, understanding that uh, we need him more than ever right now. We thank you for all that you've been doing for the Wesleyan Fellowship Group. We are so excited about things that are happening, and yet we know it's not uh, it's stuff that we cannot control. So we'll do our best, and we ask you to help us and to uh, bless this ministry, bless this church, as we bring the people that are going to be looking to us for leadership and for traditional values. We say this, in a, and also in a prayer that you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 27. The New Jerusalem. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for the words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the adulterers and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The New Jerusalem. The Bride of the Lamb. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall and twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, 
three in the north, three in the south, and three in the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper, and city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelve amethysts. The twelve gates were of twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord of God, the Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by, it, by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Here ends the lengthy reading of the Word of God. <laughs> For the people of God, thanks be to God. of scripture when I was a student at uh, Covenant College in the late 1970s at a Christian college on top of Lookout Mountain, Georgia. Chattanooga is the city at the base of the mountain there, and it is the official denominational college of the Presbyterian Church in America, of which I am a minister, of which Coral Ridge up the street is a part. Well, it so happened that we had chapel there every day for a good half hour or so. And there came a time when Professor Halverson was given an opportunity to speak to the student body. He was a short, eccentric man. He taught music at the college. Sort of a goatee and little white hair and the kind of man that you'd see at about this height <laughs> above the pulpit. But he got up and he opened his Bible and said, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter one. So we all did, assuming that he was going to read a few verses. As it turned out, he read the entirety of the book of Ephesians. And he did that because it was a letter written to the churches. And it was a circular letter. And it was intended to be read in its entirety. I suspect that if someone sends you a letter, you don't just cherry pick a sentence or two here and there and say, okay, that's enough. But you read it from beginning to end, especially if it's someone that you know that loves you and is writing to you because they care about you. I think that was in the spring semester. Professor Halverson was again given a chapel in the fall, and as he stood in the chapel, he said, please turn with me to the book of Galatians. So we knew what he was about to do, and he did it again. 
And then, as it turned out, he had a little picture put in the student newspaper. And there was a little cartoon caricature of him behind the pulpit asking for us to please turn with him to the book of Genesis. <laughs> I'd like to speak with you from chapter 21 of the book of Revelation this evening. It's a chapter that I think has much relevant teaching for us upon whom has come the end of the ages. And I think it allows us to move outside of our immediate circumstances without ever leaving where we are. And what I mean by that is in the midst of the busyness of, of life, and in your case, an effort to start a new and a young congregation with all the, the busyness that will be associated with that. And by busyness, I mean the kind of good busyness of doing the Lord's work in the Lord's way in his own time, not simply activities for the sake of keeping people busy, but investing ourselves in the things that matter most to God and for the nurture of our life as Christians through word and sacrament and prayer, evangelism, care and mutual upbuilding of the body of Christ. All those things can keep us busy. And in the midst of that, we can become tired. We get out of breath. We know that as we get older, we get out of breath easier. And it takes a little longer for us to recoup, as we say, and get back into the swing of things. Perhaps I'm only speaking about myself, but in case I'm not, you all understand what I'm trying to say here. But I thought it would be helpful for just a few moments to glance at some of the emphases in this passage by way of reminder of that in which we share, which is bigger than our immediate tiredness, bigger than our immediate energy level, bigger than even our activities, part of something that God began long before we came into existence, part of something that's going on presently in our lives, and part of something that will continue even when we pass from this life into the next. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Our Father, as we come into your presence now, we thank you for this moment in time when we can look here at this next to last chapter of the Bible. May you bless us as we come into this time together, as we seek to look carefully again at some of the teaching of your word that we may better understand who we are in order that we may understand you better as well as you have revealed yourself in Holy Scripture and your purposes for us as your redeemed people in the midst of this world and the transition that is taking place between this time and eternity to come. We ask for your Spirit's help illuminating our hearts and minds to the strengthening of our walk in Christ, to his glory and honor, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All of us live somewhere. And by that, I mean we all have an address of some kind or another. We all live in some box somewhere, unless it's a tent. I'm assuming most of us have boxes. It could be an independent box that we call a house. It could be a box that's part of a bigger building and we call it a unit. But we have an address. And that address has a zip code. Maybe it has an apartment number as well. And that particular address is located on a street. And that street is in some community. We might call it a borough, we might call it a town, we might call it a city. And any one of those places is also part of something bigger than itself called a county. And counties are part of states, and states are part of our nation. And there are any number of ways that we could identify with where we are in relation to some address that connects us to a particular place. When you read a chapter like this, this particular chapter is helping us to remember that the address that we have presently is but temporary. And there is a permanent address which we are en route to. And as much as we sometimes don't know where the new place is that we might call home when we move from one place to another, we learn the details of the address later. In this case, Scripture is telling us in advance that the address that lies before us has direct relevance 
for where we live right now, today. And what John is showing us in this chapter is the way in which heaven and earth, as it were, intersect in the bigger purposes of what God is accomplishing for his son and for the people that Jesus laid his life down for. John says at the outset, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and that there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. It's quite a picture, isn't it, that he's describing? This new heaven, this new earth, replacing, as it were, the first heaven and the first earth, which is passed away. And now recognizing that there is no longer a sea present. In the Bible, the sea often represents turmoil and chaos. It's the place of Leviathan. It's the place of the dead. It's described as a place where the ocean waves, as it were, like the wicked, constantly churning, never, never settling. And the sea has now been disappeared and been taken, as it were. It's no longer a part of what lies before. Not because God is against the sea, but because what the sea represents in the Bible is no longer there in that place Hi, where heaven and earth have been renewed and all has become fresh. It's of a, of a new kind, as it were. In fact, the newness is described as something that is not just new in time, but new in its very identity and character. The Greek language has a couple different words that we translate into English as new. And the word here is used to describe something that has that newness, that freshness to it. And he says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Did you notice as we read this passage that what God is making new, this new heavens and new earth, is also connected to that which is called his bride. And it's also described as the new Jerusalem. So it's both an individual, that's what a bride is, but it's also a community, that's what a city is. And those two images are the ones that God wants us to have to understand that which in which we share. And you know, when you read the book of Revelation, if you have done any reading in the Old Testament, you'll know that John is actually drawing his imagery here from the prophet Isaiah in chapters 60 and 65, and also from the prophet Ezekiel, particularly chapters 40 through 48. And there's also allusion and connection with the book of Genesis as well. There's the garden, there's the tree of life, there's the nourishment that comes in the way in which God had favored his creation and placed man and woman in it, to enjoy not only that, but ultimately to enjoy all that which he has made in relation to him. Because ultimately these other things don't give the satisfaction apart from life before God in relationship to God. And that, of course, has been the challenge of humanity since it left the garden, trying to find meaning and happiness, trying to recover something of the Garden of Eden with all of its spoils without the presence of the God of the garden. And it never works. And God will not allow people to find satisfaction in that which has been created. If anything, that which has been created become the object of their idolatry. Whether they literally bow down and worship something that is in earth or something that they make with their own hands that comes from earth. But either way, it becomes idolatry. And God will not have that. He's a jealous God. He's a sovereign Lord. And he alone is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. 
But the imagery is there, and he says he sees a bride adorned for her husband. That's the language that Paul uses in Ephesians 5, where the church is the bride of Christ. And Christ is the groom who comes for his bride and, and who loves her with a selfless love, and he gives himself for her. And she, in turn, lives in submission to his lordship, in subordination to him as the head of the life that they share together. Human marriage draws its analogy from what the Bible teaches about Christ as the head of the church, and the church being the bride in relation to and submission to her head and her lord. And John describes that here as well. And then that loud voice from the throne, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. The tabernacle was the place that God dwelt in the midst of the nation of Israel. It was the place that he had given to his redeemed people, whereby they could meet with him and seek his mercy and offer him worship. And you'll remember from our previous studies that there was one way into that tabernacle courtyard from the east side, but one gate, one, one, gate, one door, one way in. Just as Jesus would later say that he is the way. One way. And the first thing that you met when you came in was that altar where sacrifice needed to be made for sin. Then the laver of washing. And then the holy place and inside the holy of holies. That small 15 by 15 foot cubicle. Part of the larger 30 foot cubicle as it were that existed. In which God himself representatively dwelt. In which the Ten Commandments were kept. In which... Moses, or Aaron's rod that had blossomed, was kept, in which a pot of manna was kept, by way of reminder. And then, of course, the candles and the showbread and the imagery of that outer room, the symbolism of the high priest going in on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for the nation's sins, and that symbolism being represented by the tabernacle being placed in the middle of the 12 tribes of Israel, like the hub and the tribes being like the spokes of a wheel coming out from it, where life was centered around God, first and foremost. And so the language here draws upon what we call the Old Testament to help the people of God understand that the future is no different than the past, but it's perfected in a way in which sin is gone, and evil is not present, and the uncleanness that comes with sin has been removed. Because as we learn from reading that passage, there is no place for the filthy and the unclean and the immoral. It's not just a matter of guilt. It's a matter of uncleanness. And the uncleanness of what sin does by bringing pollution into the presence of God. And we've talked about that over the weeks past. You understand something of that. And we know and of course are reminded of it nowadays because of the pandemic and the need to be washing our hands. You hear it on the radio, 20 seconds, here's how you do it. I just had a video training me how to wash my hands again. All kinds of emphasis on trying to mitigate spread because of taking the initiative to clean up. And what are we cleaning up? Surfaces for sure. We'll never forget Tony's spray bottle, no matter where you move, this room or the other. It'll probably go with him, but he's going to need a bigger one for the gym. So be careful. It may look like a, like a fire extinguisher as he's walking around trying to do that. But we understand cleanliness and separation. And John is being exposed to that right here. And then verse 4, in the glory of this moment of what he sees with the tabernacle of God coming among men, and that tabernacle or temple being God himself. He says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. You know, you read passages like this, and you say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't want to continue to live in the midst of this mess of which we all know. As I read a passage like this in preparation for today, I read it afresh this morning after the week that I've just lived. And I thought it might be helpful one last time to just remind you of what God is giving us 
in Christ. Day one of this past week, I met a 62-year-old woman who couldn't talk, who was a crack cocaine addict, and she was having the ventilator removed. People couldn't come to see her, they didn't want to. And as it so happened, her junkie friends had tried to lie in her care and get drugs from some of the authorities, acting as if though they were family members and they were discovered. But it was all too late, and eventually she ended up in that place of care, and the decision was made to take the vent off. That means you're breathing on your own, just like we are doing here in this room. When I went back on day two, she was still with us, surprisingly. But when I went back on day three, she wasn't there. Day two of this week, I wasn't able to meet either of these people directly, and I wasn't able to talk to one of the two. Who are the two people I'm referring to? A mother and her daughter. The mother was elderly and in the hospital with ailments plus COVID. The decision had been made to remove the bed. Do you know who had to make that decision? The daughter, who was in the same hospital, also with COVID, in her 40s, unable to even see her mom, even though they were both in the same building, but on different floors. She was a Christian. We became friends. Her husband studied for the ministry. We hope to get together and talk when she's out of the hospital. But that was her circumstance. That was the moment that she found herself in. Day three, a death visit, a Hispanic family, modest income, modest neighborhood. The daughter had cared for her mother for five years in the hospice. Family was of a different colored background, a lot of tattoos, piercings, that kind of thing, but friendly people, nice people in many ways, open to my conversation with them. In fact, before I left, I asked if I could pray with them. I shared the gospel with the family, and there were a lot of people in this little house, neighbors, family, friends. I shared the gospel. I prayed. I was surprised at the end of my prayer because when I said amen, they all shouted corporately, amen. Maybe there was faith there in ways I didn't see. Day four, with a man by himself, not much time. I prayed for him because I was requested to go. And as I prayed, the aide that was there also said amen. And some of these people that are helping are Christians. We ended up having a great conversation. Very godly woman. She actually had her tracks with her to give out. She was a very committed Christian. She's actually part of the Jamaican congregation, not too far from where we're sitting right now. She invited me to come. And she said, it's a lively service, you know. <laughs> she said, we stand most of the time, if that's okay. And I said, what time does your service start? And she told me, and she said, it gets over at this time. Well, if you added up the hours, it's a three-hour service. <laughs> but boy, was she a spirit-filled Christian, very eager to take the gospel and to be Christ's representative where she was. And she was praying for this man's salvation. Later that same day, I visited another home, a woman who lost her father. She and her husband were both very sad. She talked for hours. When we were done and I was leaving, the husband broke down and started weeping. And so we talked outside in the darkness to about 12.30 a.m. They weren't a Christian family. He even shared with me some sort of Eastern religious convictions he had and talk about crystals and their power to not only protect against EMF, but also against spirits and other things. So all kinds of people that you meet out there, but no real gospel hope in the midst of the sadness of what to do and how do we explain it to our little daughter that Grandpa isn't here without lying. Day five, in a nursing home that, if I'm your friend, I'll tell you not to go there. It was a scary, dark, just sad looking place. Looked like the kind of place that would sub for the Bates Motel movies or some horror movie from the 50s. It was not good. Pray for that individual there, who they were a Christian, then sent to another place that looked like it was owned by the Atlantis, and it looked like a five-star hotel. 12.30 this morning, I was there when the undertaker came. The man asked if he could hug his wife, now wrapped by the undertaker and ready to leave the apartment, one last time. He got out of his wheelchair and went over and tried to hug her, and he shared with her and shaped how much he loved her. 
They almost made it to 75. It was 75 years of marriage. Oh, wow. and it was about to happen in the next couple of weeks. Those were the images that I saw this week. And then I read a verse like this, and there will no longer, no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Is that what you want? Yes. Is that what you pray for? Yes. Is that what you long for? I sure hope so. Because these are the things that all of us face. And the stories I gave today could be some other minister's stories about us tomorrow. We too are in line for a tomorrow. And Jesus said, we know not the evil that the day will bring forth. But are we prepared? Do we belong? Are we part of the bride? Do you have membership in the New Jerusalem? If an angel were to come into this room and he were to talk to us about God's mercy, and we said, do you know if, 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 if old Mrs. Smith, <laughs> does she have a heavenly address? Is, is, is her name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? What if he thumbed through the pages and said, I don't see it? Better frighten us. Better frighten her. But you see, what this passage teaches us is some belong and some don't. Some have admission and others do not. And painful as that sounds, that's what this passage says. There are those who belong to the city of God and those who belong to the city of man. But the promise is, I'm making all things new. Write these words, because they are faithful and true. It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God. And he will be my son. Luther said that Christian faith is a matter of personal pronouns. I being able to say to God, my God, and he being able to say to me, my child. Do you have that kind of filial family relationship where you can speak in the language of personal relationship with God? That you know him and that you are able to speak to him as your father, your heavenly father? To know that Christ is your brother, and then in turn to know that the people who sit beside you who have also confessed with their lips, believed with their hearts, and named Christ as their Savior and Lord, that they too are your family, and that you belong together because God has made it so, and he has expected us to act in accordance with his intentions for his adopting us into his family. That's what Paul speaks about in Romans 8, that we are adopted. We belong to him because he first made a decision to bring us into the family, into the circumference of his grace. That's what adoption is. We adopt children. God adopts us. He takes the initiative, and we are the recipients of a mercy that's not deserved, but is mercy nonetheless given to people who really shouldn't be there. And did you notice in this passage of the way in which it speaks about not only the light that this new place is with the language of the jewels and, and the glorious effulgence of the beauty that's there. I think of the word exquisite when you read this passage. It's a word that's fallen out of use, but it's a word that's pregnant with meaning. Just the glory of those stones and, and the light that emanates from this place and, and God and the sun being the glory as it were, of their people. Some years ago, when I was a college student, I did concrete construction. And I will still remember working on one of the national park buildings in Gettysburg, where the cyclorama painting uh, once hung. They had rebuilt a section of it, and I was set up to look at some section, and they had put white stones into it. And, and the way the sunlight was coming through and the white stones that were in there, sort of shadowed by some other beams, it was speechless to see the, the luster of those stones and the moisture. And it was so simple, but it was so powerful. I've, I've never forgotten just being there and, and counting it such a privilege, tired as I was doing construction work, to see the glory of the light shining on those stones. 
And John speaks of that. He speaks as well of the symmetry of this future. And sometimes we look at these numbers and say, oh, okay, how many days and, and how large? And, 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 and the holy place was this size and now it's going to be like humongous size. And, and how big is the city that is going to be this new Jerusalem? And, and, and the walls, you know, 200 feet thick and all these things. And we, we get carried away with some of those details. And it's not wrong. God has given us the details. But why are the details given in the way that they are? They're given to help us understand the impressive expansiveness of what God is doing. That this is bigger than anything that anyone can imagine. And now there's this beauty and balance and symmetry and restored harmony to the world that God has made with the perfect proportion symbolized in the tabernacle and the holy place now taking on, as it were, universal presence. And it's a way, if you've read the Old Testament with the illusions that are being given in this passage to say what they saw in part was speaking of something far bigger, far greater, far more glorious, something that no eye has seen and no ear has heard of what God is doing in the glory of the salvation he provides. Oh, and the fertility of this place, whether it's the fruit, whether it's the nourishment that comes from the water, the language is there of a place in which there will not be any want, and all will be safe. And although there are doors to come in, the doors do not need to be shut like they were in ancient cities, because there is no threat to those who are among the redeemed. God's enemies have all been removed. God's enemies are no longer present. That's the promise of a passage like this, as it helps us to understand the intersection of heaven with earth, of the way in which what lies before us is also part of what presently we know now and know in part. Because when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are in effect saying, do now what is promised for them as that world intersects with ours in this present moment of time, reshaping everything about us. So that when we think of how we live our lives and what we live our lives for, we live in the hopeful expectation of these promises and the glory of that moment that comes to people like us who are now part of that new Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem, when you think of even that city, Oh yes, David helped to deliver it, but then he did his own crimes there. You think of that city that stoned the prophets, that city that killed its own children through child sacrifice, that city that was once destroyed in the Old Testament because of God's wrath and judgment, and that same city to be destroyed again after Jesus himself had risen from the grave. And do you remember what he said when he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, as a mother hen would cover you with her wings and protect you, so would I, but you would not come to me that you might have life, even life eternal. He said, do you not know the peace that you could have and who is present in your midst? But their desire was to go on in their own way and do as they chose. Do you realize that that risk that is described here is true of you as well? What do I mean by that? How did it so happen that the people of Jesus' day did not want to listen to what he said. It was because no matter how outwardly religious they were, and no matter how impregnated with truth they had been made over the years through the written word of God and the speaking and the preaching of God's word, somewhere along the way they decided there were things that didn't have to apply to them, and that there were passages that were not relevant and they didn't want them in their lives. And so they chose not to listen. And they said, you don't need to say that to us because we have enough religion that overlaps with what you say, but we don't have to go all the way with what you want. Well, that's no different than what Adam and Eve did. And it can happen in modern churches as well, where we stop at a certain point and say, you know what, we're Christian enough here. And we're not going to ask questions about whether or not what we say we believe is really grounded in your word, whether it's in what we teach by way of doctrine, or it's in the way that we organize as a local church. Those are all things where you as a new group of Christians starting afresh as a new congregation need to be like the Berean Christians in the book of Acts who studied the scriptures 
to see if what their teachers were saying was in fact grounded in the written word of God. You need to be students of the scripture. You always need to go back and say, is it there? And why do we do these things? Know what you believe. Know how you to live, because if you get what you believe wrong, you will not live right. And that's what went wrong in that time. Well, the passage speaks about how at the end that no unclean people will be there. No abominations, no lying, nothing like that shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. For many people, they'd say, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to be. But my question is, do you belong there? Do you belong there? This whole passage is about God coming to be among his people. And if you don't want the God of the garden and the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus himself, then you have to ask, am I just wanting the gifts without the giver of those gifts? Do I remain outside because I've never come inside by repentance and faith? Ultimately, those who share in the privileges of this new heavens and new earth are those who are alive in and foremost the Lord Jesus Christ. Can it be said of you? Is that who you are? Do you have citizenship in the new Jerusalem? Are you part of the bride of Christ? Only you can answer that. But I can tell you that there's only one right answer that you need to give. And that's through coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By turning from your sin, that's what the passage says. You can't have both. You want to keep the one, you can't have the other. Make your choice. The time is short. The new heavens and earth are upon us. Our Father, we thank you for this passage, what it reminds us of, and I pray that everyone in this room would find their citizenship in that heavenly realm. I pray that they may all be members of the new Jerusalem, whether they be young or old, and that they may find their delight in the mercy of God that comes through Christ Jesus, their Lord, their Savior, their Redeemer, that one who is the Alpha and the Omega, that one who is making all things new, and in whose life we find life, even life eternal. May this be a congregation in which all who are present here today is true and may be a place of life and light to the community in which it seeks to bear witness to Christ in the days that lie before it. I pray these things on their behalf, in Jesus' name.
couple of announcements I want to go through tonight. Uh, number one. Is that better? Yeah. Number one. Freddie, thank you. I love yeah. thank you. It's awesome. So uh, next Saturday, uh, as Doug, I just want to reiterate what Doug had mentioned to us earlier today in the announcements. Uh, next Saturday night at 6 o'clock, we will be meeting in the gym. The seating will be very different than what we're doing here. We'll be setting up individual chairs six feet apart. We'll be setting up chairs for couples if it's just two people coming. We'll have areas where entire families can come if they want to bring four, five, six people. And because we're not locked in with the chairs like we are in the sanctuary here with the binders between the seats, if, if somebody shows up with 12 people and they want to sit together, that's fine also because we've got plenty of room to spread out there. And what we're hoping is as, you know, as this virus winds down and more and more people get vaccinated, we're hoping more and more people that have not been attending because they're still homebound and they're really locked into their homes as they feel more comfortable. We're really looking forward to getting a big crowd of people out and getting things moving. And uh, so I'm really hoping that everybody, if you're comfortable or if you're feeling that it's time to get back to church, that you should come and please join us next Saturday night because we have a new pastor starting. And I think it would be just awesome for all of us. The uh, second thing I wanted to discuss tonight is that this is Pastor Jim's last last service with us tonight. Um, would you like to join me up here, Joe? <laughs> would you like to join That's me up here? Choice. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess you can stay there. You know, I listen to the stories that you told tonight, yeah. and, my, and my heart breaks when I hear these stories of people that are passing from this earth and the grieving that their loved ones are going through and, and these issues with this COVID and people in the same hospitals that can't see each other. And you know, I can't help but to ask myself, how does God allow such a thing to happen? But when I listen to the culmination of Jim's stories, I then have to say, hey, how thankful that we have a merciful God who sends people like Jim into these situations to meet with these people who are passing, that are meeting and helping the people that are grieving and sitting down and continuing to spread the word of the gospel with them at the most important times where they feel like they're just down and out with nothing left to look forward to. And people like Jim, God has sent us people like him and he has just been awesome for us. And I just wanted to say that for all of us, uh, it's, of course, saying goodbye is never easy for anybody, with anybody, but saying goodbye to our pastors, a very difficult item, and tonight it certainly is no exception. It's very difficult for us to say goodbye, and by goodbye, I certainly don't mean goodbye forever, I certainly, we all hope that you, and Susan, and Michaela, and Isaiah will continue to worship with us each week, and, uh, we want to wish you the best on your new journey because we know that God's going to set you guys up with something really exceptional. <laughs> I'm sure a man of your talents is going to put just where he needs to be. Uh, we, uh, from the entire congregation, we want to thank you for, for stepping up and being such a committed, traditional pastor and being our leading shepherd here for the last four months. Uh, we're a group that, you know, we were hoping to find someone that could help us with this and Jim has done a wonderful job for us uh, we want to thank you for being so genuine uh, for being so honest and so true to the gospel and holding to God's word um, for being so loving your whole family being so loving and caring and kind and attending church with you and uh, just holding up to God's word and most importantly we want to thank you for for helping us sustain and continue to grow the fellowship group because we never quite know week to week when we first started whether we would still be here or we wouldn't be here. It's just, it's a tough thing. God sent you into our life and we are very thankful for it and we thank you. Amen. Shall we pray? 
Dear Father, we pray for Jim Garrison tonight. Jim is a true Christian son and a true Christian brother to all of us. Father, bless, bless Jim. He has dedicated his life to your word and the gospel of Christ. Keep him safe in his travels and please answer his prayers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Congregation put together a box of gifts for you and Susan, uh, just as a small token of our thanks and our gratitude for the whole of the Dungeons. And uh, we hope you know that we all love you and we hope to see you whenever you're around. Thank you. prophecy of this book. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.